Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, um, we're answering a question that I get asked uh, surprisingly commonly. Uh, what are some changes I would make to the Montana class battleships? So, the Iowa class battleships are the last American battleships that are completed. However, contemporary to the Iowa design was a slower but more heavily armored and armed uh, battleship that was going to be more or less the same size. And these two parallel designs went side by side. And the only reason the Iowa design gets chosen to be completed first is because the U.S. had never built any sort of fast battleship or battle cruiser. And so, uh, especially with the Japanese Congo class out there and moving more towards carrier operations, which are faster uh, ships, the Navy decided to build some of uh, these fast capital ships and then go back to building the old slow ones. Of course, by the time the Iowas are done, the nature of warfare has completely changed uh, and the restrictions that limited the size of future battleship designs were out the window. The Navy kept modifying the Montana design up until about 1942, and then the class was more or less canceled. The problem with going after the treaties had been lifted was that the design kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it outgrew the facilities that we had to build them, it outgrew the, the Panama Canal, it outgrew the dry docks we had to ma maintain them. Which meant that not only did we have to pay for this new larger ship, but it also meant that we had to improve our building uh, slipways before we could start building them, which meant taking them out of service for a period of time during the war when we were trying to build more ships. Uh, it meant building or widening the locks of the Panama Canal. It meant building new dry docks or, or widening the ones we had, which again, takes all this stuff out of service when we need it. And so by 1942, between the new carrier aviation and deciding that it's easier to just build more of these smaller, cheaper ships that are only fractionally uh, worse than the very best battleships in the world, and arguably not even that, that uh, we'll keep going with that. We don't need to build these super ships. Now, the common uh, retort to that is the United States had no idea how big the Yamato class battleships were. And they outclassed the Iowas in displacement armor and firepower, but they're more or less equivalent to the Montanas as the design was completed. So, let's say the US Navy finds out about the Yamatos, completely freaks out, even though they've got aircraft carriers that can sink them, uh, and decides to continue building the Montanas. Now, we don't have a design that stopped in 1942. The US Navy has no battleship designs past 1942. So what changes would I make to this design over the next, let's say, four years that it would take to build these 65,000 ton super battleships. So, I'm going to limit myself to just five things here, or this video could be a thousand hours long. Um, first of all, if the Montanas do get built, there's a very strong chance that the Navy retains the Montanas rather than the Iowas. Even though the Iowas are faster battleships and better able to keep up with the carriers, the real reason that the Navy kept the Iowas is because they were the largest. They had the most reserve of buoyancy, they had the most room for training sailors and adding new things on. The Montanas would have more room even though they were slower. So I think they would be retained. It is worth considering increasing the speed of these ships, however. As naval warfare moves from heavy armored slow ships uh, to fast ships that are able to evade being seen, much less hit, and as these ships would be secondary to carriers in the future, uh, it is worth considering making them faster. The US Navy uh, planned on having two battleship speeds during their building program, the 27 or 28 knot 
slow battleships, which were still faster than the old 20 or 21 knot standards of the uh, 19 teens and 20s, and the 33 knot fast battleships of the Iowa class. The idea at that time was to continue to use them like the traditional battle lines of, of old, with three quarters of your ship being the slow battle line at 28 knots, and the final quarter or fifth being uh, the fast battleships that can then maneuver and, and uh, outmaneuver the enemy or scout for the enemy or whatnot. So um, that's why the Montanas were designed to be the same speed as the South Dakotas and North Carolinas. However, if we want these ships to last post-war, maybe we increase the speed. For the Iowa-class battleships, for every 4,000 tons of weight that you remove, you can gain an extra knot of speed. For every 4,000 tons of weight you add, you lose a knot of speed. So a quarter knot every thousand tons. The Montanas would probably be fairly similar. Um, so one thing we want to do is look at uh, how to remove weight. So we'll keep that in mind with our other four choices here. Another way you can increase the speed, however, is to just slap bigger engines in there. The United States had probably the most compact, most efficient steam turbine uh, propulsion system of World War II. Um, I'm not sure if we're building the ship in the early 40s, if we could pack a more powerful power plant in there, which is why we want to focus more on reducing weight. Uh, and we definitely, definitely don't want to focus on gigantism. You can always make the ship longer to give it a better length to beam ratio, to make it faster, to make more room for more engines. Well, now you've increased the size of your armored belt, so you've increased your weight, so you need to add more power to overcome that. Now you need more crew to man those bigger engines, and now you need more food for those guys. And so this just skyrockets, and now you've got this super battleship that's 100,000 tons that you're never going to get the money to uh, build. So we're going to stop the uh, gigantism right here at the 65,000 ton mark where these ships were in, uh, uh, in 1942 when their design stopped. And if we can even find things to remove, all the better. So uh, my next change also falls under the removing weight. The Montanas were still designed with an armored conning tower for the captain, just like the Iowas have. On the Iowa-class battleships, this structure is roughly 600 tons of armor, and not only is it a lot of weight, it's also a lot of weight high up in the ship, which makes the ship less stable. So, by removing the armored conning tower, we're saving weight, we're adding more stability, which gives us room to add more top weight later on, which is important because these ships are going to have sophisticated radar suites, uh, the best things that we had in the late war and post-war period, and that is going to add a tremendous amount of top weight. While the last American battleships built and designed still had armored conning towers, many of the standard type battleships that were completely rebuilt, such as Tennessee, California, and West Virginia lost their armored conning towers. Likewise, by this point, contemporary British battleships had also lost their armored conning towers. They retained a four or five inch uh, armor around the superstructure in that area as splinter protection, but they weren't adding a significant amount of weight. And there's a very low chance that if that 17.3 inch thick armored conning tower takes a hit, that it's actually going to protect the people inside. It might protect the equipment, but the people are still probably goners. Better to have an enemy shell pass in one side, out the other side, injure some people in equipment with splinters, uh, but leave some people alive. We see this happen when Prince of Wales Bridge is hit by Bismarck. The King George V battleships, of which Prince of Wales is a member, do not have armored uh, conning towers. And so the shell passes in one side, out the other, Kills a bunch of people, very tragic, but Captain Leach is still able to uh, stay alive, although wounded, and command the ship for the rest of the engagement. And the ship is able to maneuver and fight for the rest of the engagement with Bismarck and the subsequent pursuit. So that's one thing. 
The next thing I want to do is completely improve the anti-aircraft suite. By the time these ships would be entering service in the uh, mid-40s, the 40 millimeters and 20 millimeters will have been made obsolete, both by faster flying aircraft and by aircraft like Japanese kamikazes that you have to completely destroy uh, or else they still hit and damage your ship. And we know what the U.S. Navy is doing with anti-aircraft suites uh, late war and post-war. Uh, we're going to remove all the single barrel 20 millimeters right off the bat. They're no more good. We're going to remove all the 40 millimeters and replace them with the twin barreled auto, uh, automatic three inch guns that the Navy goes to post-war like we see on USS Salem. Uh, these guns mounts replace 40 millimeters on a two for three basis, uh, i.e. two of the twin three inch guns are the same weight as three of the quadruple 40 millimeter guns. So uh, we would see those guns replacing many of the 40 millimeters. Some of these other 40 millimeter positions will be replaced by new uh, gunnery directors like the other American battleships got later in the war, which allows for blind fire and other things like that. For the 20 millimeters, American ships during this time period got uh, twin mount 20 millimeters as they became available to replace the single mount. And this gave you a little bit more firepower to chew up enemy aircraft. Uh, that was not enough. And ultimately these guns are removed by 1951. So what I would add is the quadruple 20 millimeter powered Thunderbolt mountings. Some American battleships, including Massachusetts, uh, began to get these mountings right at the end of the war. And uh, using power and four mountings in one, these things were able to very rapidly track and chew up enemy aircraft. However, they were expensive and complicated to manufacture compared to just slapping more single 20 millimeters on. They also save weight because now you've got one or two guys manning a four gun battery as opposed to eight. So you're saving a lot of crew weight and, and those anti-aircraft guns are where your crew starts to balloon and that just adds lots and lots of weight with extra supplies and everything else. So uh, I would postulate that in a setting where the Montanas are being built, we're in a long war setting. These, uh, the war is probably continuing later. Maybe we don't drop the bomb and we invade Japan. Maybe uh, we've lost it midway and so uh, we're not relying on carriers anymore. That's why we're building battleships. Uh, so something is different and this ship needs better anti-aircraft. So we're, in addition to continuing to develop this ship, we're going to say we continue to develop and manufacture the Thunderbolt mountings and uh, we're going to put those all over the place here as well. So uh, those are my first three things. Uh, my fourth thing, again, we don't know how the U.S. Navy was going to continue developing battleships post-1942 but we know how they continued developing cruisers for two generations post-war. Um, we know this from the various types of cruisers that were built. So for example, in the heavy cruiser category armed with eight inch guns, the next closest thing to a battleship, you have the Baltimore class, which is your wartime ship. They've got the forward superstructure, they've got two funnels, uh, and then an after fire control tower. Those Baltimores, are reconfigured into the uh, Oregon City class uh, immediately post-war, and three of those ships are built on the same exact Baltimore hull. They improve the anti-aircraft capability of these ships by making the superstructure more compact and by trunking the exhaust into a single funnel instead of two. This leaves you with more centerline space for anti-aircraft guns, and when you can put anti-aircraft guns on the centerline, that means they can fire on both sides which increases your firepower and reduces your weight because now you don't have two mounts, you've only got a single mount and you've got more firepower on the side. So we know that the Navy planned this for Illinois and Kentucky. They started looking at a redesign for those ships uh, called the King Nimitz redesign that would have compressed the superstructure, singled the funnel and moved uh, the five inch guns so that there was only four on each side uh, on the sides and one forward and one aft at the superstructure in the space that you've saved by compressing the smokestacks. Uh, there would also probably be room for three inch guns on the center line when you do that as well. So that is 
also something that we're probably going to do with this Montana class. If they had have actually been built, they would have probably redesigned the superstructure completely uh, to be like that. Uh, and we see this trend continue into the Des Moines, the last of the gun cruisers like USS Salem. And if you go and visit her, you see a relatively compact superstructure and uh, a uh, trunked funnel and center line uh, five inch guns and all of that stuff. My fifth thing that I'm going to do is improve the flag spaces on these ships. One of the greatest jobs that the Iowa class battleships did in the 40s and 50s was act as fleet flagships. And they were chosen, even though battleships were starting to be obsolete, because they had more room for these large fleet admirals and their full staffs than, say, the aircraft carriers with their really tiny superstructures. So I want to design larger fleet flagship facilities into these ships from day one. The flag bridges on Iowa-class battleships are relatively compact because of the armored conning tower. Whereas, if you go on USS Salem and you see the flag bridge of a post-war cruiser like that, and she is used as a, a fleet flagship in the Mediterranean, you see a much, much larger space. And uh, we've got room to expand that lower level now that we've removed the conning tower. Uh, so those are my five major changes that I would make to Montana-class battleships to make them more survivable and more relevant in a, post, uh, in a late World War II and post-war environment. And I'm doing this without modifying the gun batteries or the armor plate because those are long lead items that, uh, let's say we decide to build these ships in 1942, those things get ordered immediately even before the keels get laid. Uh, so I don't, now that I'm redesigning this in 1942, 1943 to incorporate wartime lessons, I don't want to make major changes to the armor or the guns or anything else like that. And let's face it, uh, the 16 inch 50 caliber guns of the Iowa class battleships, the, the Mark 7 gun is the best battleship weapon ever put to sea. So what are some changes you would like to see to the Montana class battleships? Let us know in the comment section down below. Did I forget anything that uh, you think is important? Remember, I was limiting myself to just five so that this video isn't 10 hours long. Uh, but if you think there's something more important than my changes, let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to support the museum and our channel. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us. Thanks for watching.